even know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at this wall of fame on my Zoom. I'm like, what? What is happening? Is... <laughs> Y'all got the right dude? Like, we make sure, make, make sure I got the right. I, I didn't get the wrong link. This is we got we got the right dude. We, oh, we, got right. we know who you are. We got okay. you. Yeah. <laughs> trust, trust me, we don't let no regular people in here, baby. Okay, all right, all right. I appreciate it. Man. You got Where that? Are you, Nate? Yo, where are yo, you, bro? yo, you got that? I got it. I got it. I got where it. Where you at, Nate? Where are you? Nice to meet you. I'm, I'm, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm I'm in uh, at, at home in Virginia. I live in Richmond, Virginia now. Really? Oh, wow. okay. 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 Yeah. I was in New York for a long time. I was in New York for um, 19 years. Wow. And yeah, I moved in. I moved to New York on uh, in 2001. I moved up actually a week before 9-11. And then I'm, yeah. And then I moved out in the middle of COVID. That, that, <laughs> that, that, that's my New York experience. <laughs> Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. What's up, baby? I'm good, man. How are you? Um, I'm trying to get out of this whatever cough I had. But oh, other yeah. than that, <clears throat> I'm cool. Because I'm sitting here talking with my brethren. I'm cool. Beautiful, man. Beautiful. We originally started doing this when COVID hit and okay. everybody stopped touring yeah. a couple years ago. Yeah. And a little quick backstory. We started doing this. We're just, you know, no agenda or anything. We're doing yeah. our Zoom and a few months into it. We did it every week, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, yeah. Friday, wow. right? For an hour and a half each time, a couple hours. Just zooming. Yeah. And we're having so much fun. We go, we got to start inviting people. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be just drummers. It could be anybody, both drummers and newspaper writers, this, yeah. that, everything, man. And if we just, no agenda, no script. And we just talk and, and have a blast. And it's been oh, fascinating. Man. I mean, just, all, you know, and in talking to drummers, I mean, how many times does a drummer sit down and talk to five other drummers? Probably yeah, right. not. I can't, right. Off. I mean, it just it doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a very cool uh, template, you know? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. When I saw the email from Mike, I was like, well, first of all, I saw the names and I was like, yeah. Well, yes, of course. You know what I mean. Man? He said, "No, these old guys. What am I going to say to these old guys?" <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, I, well, I, I ain't course. got nothing to say to these old guys." Come on. I said, man. "I said, well, wait, wait a minute. Now, what am I going to say? Like, I, <laughs> like I, you know, you know, I'm just watching a video earlier today. I'm watching a video of of you, Lenny, playing with Freddie Hubbard at the Vanguard. Oh, jeez. You know? And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, and I, the, you know, hot, the hottest like, day, the hottest day ever. Ever. I mean. I mean, like it was so hot that day, and if you look at Cedar and yeah. me, yeah. with and Freddie sweating, but Ron Carter is cool as a cucumber. There ain't no sweat at all. You know, he's just there. He's doing just it. there, right? right? Yeah, man. I'm sorry. And then two days ago, somebody posted a clip of Herbie from like mid '70s, whatever. And there's there's Mike, in, you know, in the back, and it's just grooving. Like it is. I'm like. So what now? What what am I doing? <laughs> what what am I doing here? You know, but listen, I'm I'm thrilled to just be a part of the hang. You know, so thank you. So hey, let me ask you something, Nate, if I may. All right, so Betty Carter kind of discovered yes. you. Is that what happened? You were in college playing. Yeah, um, tell us a little about that. Absolutely. in In the summer of uh, 1995, I worked at Disney World, um, and I was in the the Disney Grammy band down there. Hmm. Uh, Ron McCurdy was the director down there. And uh, also in the band was a great trombone player from Houston named Andre Hayward. And so Andre had just done the first year of Jazz Ahead with Betty. And so Jazz Ahead, the residency that she started, um, I think it was like at the time, it was like a five day residency. And so she would bring in young cats from all over, put them together have cats start playing each other's tunes, bring everybody brought tunes in. And it was a bit like a sort of a, a little uh, network that she built of young players, you know? And so Andre, the summer of 95, he was like, man, I want to tell Betty about you. I think, I think you should meet Betty, you know? Um, so in January of 96, uh, I was at the IAJE convention back in, in Atlanta, right? The old school, you know? 
And uh, I was there playing with my college band and Betty showed up to our showcase. And uh, she stood in the back and Andre was with her. And and afterwards I shook her hand and she was like, I like the way you play, you sound good, you know? And I said, oh, wow, you know? So, and then a, uh, about a month or two later, um, Andre called me and said, Betty wants you to come do jazz ahead at, uh, at Brooklyn Academy of Music. So it was, it was uh, spring of 1996 when I did jazz ahead. That was when, um, I forget, maybe it was, it was March or April of that year, but uh, we did a five day residency. I met a ton of cats. It was my first time meeting Eric Harland. He was one of the other drummers there. Um, Eric is a couple years younger than me and he was killing. He's always sounded that good. You know, Eric has always sounded that good. So, uh, and at the time, a great drummer from Philly named Byron Landum had the gig with Betty. And so he was her main guy, you know? So it was me, Byron, and Eric. We were the first, uh, I, I, that was my first time doing Jazz Ahead was with those two guys. And I worked with Betty on and off until she died in 98. So I didn't know her that long, basically from 96 to 98. There was a great drum teacher in Virginia, this guy named Howard Curtis. Howard was like the guy that taught a lot of the, the younger drummers. I mean, I, you know, I studied with Howard in grad school for a little bit. And Howard was one of those guys, great, great drummer, but kind of never, he didn't, I don't think he ever moved, at least not for a long time, never left the area, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, but a lot of cats played with Howard, a lot of cats came, you know, sort of through Howard. Sure. Um, yeah. What did he have you studying? What you know, when I first, you know, I didn't have a private instructor up until, um, actually until college. So, but when I was, when I went to grad school at Virginia Commonwealth University here in Richmond, I had a year with Howard. And so Howard was turning me on to all kinds of stuff, man. We would just listen to records and he would, he was turning me on to Victor Lewis. He was turning me on to Lewis Nash. Um, he was the first cat who really turned me on, he really made me sit down and shed the Ted Reed book. I had never really shed it before. He was like, no, just, just, just shed through like a, like a, a few of these exercises. It's going to open up your, your comping when you play. He was like, you know, shed this sync, you know, shed this and shed this stick control too. this, you know? And I was like, okay, he was the first cat who really had me like looking at and applying it to drum set, you know, but for the most part, we were listening to records. He was, we were, you know, listening to Philly Joe with the Miles Quintet. And we would just break down everything Philly Joe did. We would just talk about it for an hour. And the wow. hour would, would go by like, you know, just, I mean, gone. And wow. uh, you know, okay, I'll see you next week, you know. Um, but that was the stuff we were doing. Yeah, that was, and, you know, my my lessons with Howard. Howard made it really fun. He really did. He, he, he um, turned me on to a lot of drummers. I didn't know he turned me on to like, transcendental sonship and he turned me on to like <laughs> I, I didn't know anything about Paul Motion at the time he turned me yeah. on to, like he just really opened my mind and, and sent me on a bunch of different you know oh, uh, took me down a bunch of different rabbit holes you know yeah he was great I gotta ask you a question, Nate. Yep. Your first gig in Europe with Dave Holland was where? 2000, uh, 2002. What's, what festival was that? I Man, I don't even remember. Um, because that's that's when I first heard you. Was I that, think, that tour? I think I think it was your first gig. Wow. With the band. <clears throat> It might have been, um, I feel like we started at the old BIM house in Amsterdam. No, um, this was this was a festival. Oh, it was a it festival. Was, okay. It was a festival. Okay. So what was that? I wonder what that first festival was. Man, you're going to make me dig up my old itinerary <laughs> to find out what it was. <laughs> but I heard yeah, you play first... then. And yes. I was like, who 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 did you replace? Billy Kilson. Kilson. That's right. Kilson. Yeah. So... <clears throat> and, yeah, because I, I had gone. I I was on that festival. I played with somebody on that festival, yeah. and I heard you play, and I was like, "Uh oh, uh oh, <laughs> uh oh, man!" Uh -oh. man. <laughs> At, that was 
I got to say, man, it, you know, coming in after Billy, you know, Billy was such a big part of that band <laughs> sound. Sure. And he, you know, the interplay between him and, and the horn, you know, all that stuff that he does, that he does so masterfully, is really intimidating to come in after that, man. No, 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 no. You were not intimidated. Let me let you know. Let me okay. re-familiarize you with okay. what you did. You were okay. not intimidated because I was like, oh, whoa. You know, because I had heard Billy with the band. Yeah. And this was like the first time you had played with him, I yeah. believe. Yeah. And man, I was like extremely impressed. I was like, yo, man, this guy got another kind of vibe to it. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. That yeah, That's a huge beautiful. compliment. And, and also to Dave's credit, Dave never asked me to mimic Billy. No. Dave always kind of, you know, was very encouraging about do your thing, play it your way. You know, um, he was, he was really great about that. Cause he, I think he could sense that I was, you know, nervous. <laughs> I think he could, he knew. Yeah. But you know, since that time that I first heard you like that, yeah. you have your own sense of yeah. groove, of yeah. groove. <laughs> which yeah. really is special hmm. because I see your little snippets of stuff yeah. like that. Uh, I, but you got a groove, baby. Thank you. I man. mean, thank you for real. Thank you, man. I, Maybe, I don't know if it's Virginia vibe or what. I don't know. It, I'll say it works. <laughs> it works. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No, that's, that's a, that's a huge compliment. I mean, you know, there is, um, I stole a lot of stuff like most musicians. You know, well, we all do. Them. We all do. I stole a whole lot, a whole rack of stuff. You could say oh. inspired by, it, right? <laughs> okay. right? I like that. Sold, I, like, I like that. I like that. I, I like that too. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> inspired like, by, yes, yes, yes. I was heavily I like inspired that. by yeah. a lot of great drummers. Um, right. you know, before you know, and and growing up, man, my pop had the record collection. My dad was into instrumental R&B from like mid 70s to mid 80s. It, it became smooth jazz, you know, yeah. but before that, it was just killing, you know, it was just headhunters and it was um, my, it was like uh, Bob James and it was David Sanborn. And it was like that music and, and those drummers. It was like hard was a lot more, uh, you know, experimenting. And, yes. You know, improvision. Yeah. Play, improvision. yeah. Am I wrong in saying that Clyde plays uh, was important to you? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I can hear him in you at times yeah. when you're headed that way, you know. Yes. Oh, no, yeah. for sure. I mean, you know, I, like a lot of the cats coming up when I came up, I found that James Brown greatest hit CD. And it did not have the funky drummer on it, but it, it there was enough. There was enough on it for me to to cop and like really get into what Clyde was doing, what what Jabo was doing, really get into that, and not really knowing who those guys were because I didn't, you know, James Brown wasn't played in the house that much, so I kind of found him on my own. Um, so I didn't know who the players were, but I over time learning about it and just kind of getting into the well of 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 groove and language that they brought to to that music you know um and then when i finally did discover the funky drummer record you know and it's the, everybody talks about the one four bar loop and that everybody sampled but it's like the entire record is incredible like i feel like clyde discovered a, a whole planet that on that record you know he discovered a whole solar system on that session you know sure. and um it really you know it changed the way i play for sure. When I heard Give It Up or Turn Me Loose live at Augusta, that's the funkiest thing I've ever heard a human being do since I've been on this planet. And oh. and, the, and it ain't easy to play. It's innovative. And it still sounds new. To, when I hear it today, even though I know how to play it because he showed me. Yeah. Oh, wow. Sound like him. But when yeah. I hear him do it, I'm like, I'm like the RCA dog. Like, it's like I'm 15 again or something. I'm like, huh? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> You haven't approached uh, a kind of a philosophy.
philosophy or uh, approach the way that you do both rhythm and the way you approach music in general? Um, you know, I think I think so. I find myself more aware of it now. I'm I'm always um, I'm trying to, and this I don't know if this is going to sound weird or not, but I'm always trying to speak the parts while I play. Uh -huh. Like I'm really like I'm I'm kind of singing along with with yeah. drum parts while I play, and it forces me to do two things. It forces me to breathe, which helps me with phrasing, you know, and also it really kind of forces me to be patient too. Like when I'm playing, I'm I'm teaching myself more and more to wait, you know. Like I want I want to I have a bunch of ideas, a hundred ideas a minute, but. I'm trying to not deploy all of it all the time. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, and if anything, you know, the, the patience is the thing I'm working on, you know, as a, as a musician, like it's just trying to get more and more. Um, I don't know, just be more and more mindful of my spots when I play, you know? Yeah. And so just knowing that the groove, the groove is enough. There's a lot of information in the groove, you know, and yeah. it doesn't necessarily need to be, over seasoned or over you know you, there's a there's plenty of information in, especially if the groove is 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 good yeah and the band is playing together there's plenty of information there already you know it's like um it's it's easy to get sort of distracted or get you know restless in that so i'm i'm constantly sort of pushing back against that you know yeah when I play. um Lenny white taught me about breathing like 40 years ago or something but um, well, I, the, the way I've been looking at at rhythm or entering into you know music that's that's going on is like I see it as a river flowing. It's, yeah, it's already flowing, so you don't have to you know change it. You just like put your foot in it yeah. and and do. It's more like skipping rocks or uh, yeah. water or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I feel like when it's really happening the the right way uh maybe i'm not thinking so much maybe i'm just playing maybe i mean i'm 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 mindful of what i'm doing but i'm not i, you know, I used to tell my students all the time whenever i i taught private lessons i would think about how i sound but i wouldn't worry about how i sound you know <laughs> and that line between oh man this is uh oh, this feels so good or is it good? I don't know. I don't, that, that's a very thin line. You know, you can, you can cross over that line real quick and not even know, you know? So I'm always um, trying to be more aware of that, you know, in, in kind of like being in a conversation, you know, the music you're, have, you're come conversing with everyone. Yes. When it's going right. There's, yeah. there's, no, there's no questions. It says what it says and it's powerful, absolutely. you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you're listening to, I mean, I guess, yeah. Listening is is probably ninety percent of it for yeah, me. Absolutely, is, you know, you listen most of the time and react a little bit. You know, yeah, yeah, man. I've found that it's about translation, hmm. and in talking to my students, uh, if we are artists and we have ideas in our heads in our hearts and we want to get these ideas out to the other musicians that are in the band and to the other people that are listening to us yep. it's about how we translate it mm -hmm. and in finding out that translation that's how i find a little bit more about what it is i have to say yeah and the best way that i can say it yeah yeah agreed Agreed, 100%. And well said. Well said, too. All of us are drummers and composers. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. Yeah. And what is your concept mm. in writing music? Mm. Mm. Again, about the translation. Right. Right. You know, I um, I think about I, at this point in my career, I feel like I'm still and I guess this will this will be an ongoing thing, but I feel like I'm still introducing myself to people. Um, and especially as a band leader and composer, because 
you know, it. I think it's a little different now. I see a lot of drummers leading bands now, but but for a while there weren't that many cats out here playing, you know, with the drums at the center of the band and and like you know, um, so like I said, I grew up um, with that music, that seventies eighties music in in the house. So it was Quincy, and it was you know. Earth, Wind, and Fire, and it was that it was it was stuff that was pop, but was also had a lot of jazz information in it because the musicians who made it were great jazz musicians, you know. Progressive, it was progressive. It was very progressive, and yeah. and really ahead of its time. Like it's amazing to me, and I I don't want to get too far off on a rant, but it's amazing that when hip hop came along, and when sampling capability came along. The first record they went rec records they went to were those records. They went to like R and B sort of golden age. I call it golden age R and B. You know, yes, exactly. You know, because they sampled you. <laughs> you know what I mean? They sampled y'all. They they went to that 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 vault because the music had already been created. You know, and they just looped it and copied and pasted it and added their verse to it, but. You know, yeah. it was already there. It was hip hop before hip hop, you know, before there was a term for it. So, um, but anyway, I'm sorry, I, I got. Oh, please. It's okay. It's no, it, it gets good to me. I get, you know, I get filled with the Holy Ghost. So I got. That's, I, all, that's all right. You, know, you, you among but, friends here. Yeah, you among I appreciate friends. it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, we don't have a microscope. Okay. This is not a clinic. This is not okay. a clinic. Okay. <laughs> that's good to know. But, but, but conceptually, though, I do kind of always come back to that um, that moment in my uh, childhood, young personhood, where I discovered music, and that that sense of like discovery is the thing I'm trying to convey, trying to translate in my music. So I want there to be something in the music, something built in the music that makes it sort of rediscoverable every time somebody listens to it you know I, man i didn't i didn't hear that the first time i didn't hear this layer this you know and that's an ongoing process you know that's an ongoing thing but i'm also interested in using you know playing it's been done many many times but i'm also interested in in playing odd meter grooves in a way that feel natural that don't feel odd you know that feel danceable even mm -hmm. No. You, you find the hitch. Yeah. There, there's always a hitch yeah. in the groove. And That's you right. find that hitch. And when you play that hitch, that means there's no seams. Yeah. Yeah. You there's know, no I, hear, <clears throat> I hear you experimenting with that. Yeah. In, in poly ways, when you're uh, over the bar, polyrhythmical, whatever the words are, yeah. and also odd times. But I hear you in 4-4, four, four, yeah. and I can hear Roy Haynes. I can hear little bits and pieces of everybody. Right. And then I can hear these poly and out things when your thinking extends. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's really, really cool, man. Yeah, man. No, it's it's and it's something it. that's, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's, yeah. that's a high compliment because it's something that, I really want to see, work into the music, but not make it um, distracting. You know, I want it to to be to feel as natural as possible. You know, but at the same time, when it happens, I want people to be like, "Whoa, wait, what? What was that?" You know what I mean? <laughs> so I don't know, but but I'm it's it's a lifelong process, lifelong journey, man. Learn how to learning about music. This is you know, I'll be doing this if I'm lucky for, for many, many years, you know? So I want to um, discover it uh, and rediscover it again and again. Talk to us about your band, man. Yeah. So um, for a long time, I've been working with a band called Kinfolk. Um, and that's the band I've sort of been touring the last... I guess maybe 10 years now. Um, and the primary uh, core of the band is a uh, great keyboardist, John Coward, um, the great bassist, Fema Efron. I think the great underrated bassist, Fema Efron. I think he's a super underrated cat. Yeah. Um, this great guitarist out of Memphis named Brad Allen Williams um, and the incredible Philadelphia homie, Jaleel Shaw on saxophone. Jaleel's, Jaleel's one of the baddest cats. He's one of the baddest. 
And um, this great singer out of Brooklyn named Alma Watt from from uh, from Brooklyn. She she writes all the lyrics to like if I give her melodies, she writes lyrics to them, and she's incredible. And that was my working band. We haven't done a lot this year. I'm not sure when we're gonna pick back up because I'm doing some other projects now. But but that was my working band for the last like ten years, and we would go out and you know forge out there braving the braving the airports with these with these with these cats. But we we had we had a lot of fun playing that music, you know. Um, what are the projects you're working on now? So this past year, um, I got to do this artist in residence uh, thing at Montreal Jazz Festival. Yeah. And I got to do three different trios. Uh, the first night, it was Lionel Lueque and Michael League. And that was, and me, and that was in, insane. Then the second night, it was these two younger dudes, this piano player named Kiefer and this bassist named Cartoons. They're more on the hip hop side they're they're both great musicians Keith is a very good jazz pianist um but that was more like sort of beat making kind of vibe and then the third night was with uh the guitarist Corey Wong yeah and Wooten on bass uh so that that was a that was a cool night that was a cool night so that um it looks like next year I'll be doing a few one-off gigs with the, with different versions of those trios um so that that I'm very excited about that. Getting to play with those guys again, you know, really excited about that. And um, at, I'm also working with a singer uh, named Brittany Howard. Oh, sure. Brittany, yeah, she she's fantastic. Brittany was in a band called Alabama Shakes for a, a long time. Very successful band. Now she's going solo. Um, I played on her first record and her her second record, which is coming out in February. So we'll be touring that a lot um, next year. And you know, various band leader project i'm doing a quartet at keystone um coming up this week with christian mcbride marquise hill on trumpet and jeffrey keys on piano um that's gonna be god help me <laughs> that's, that's gonna be it's gonna be great <clears throat> that? I, I, well, thank you uh what are you guys gonna play be playing some swing or all points uh in between and everything on yes sir okay e everything everything all definitely gonna all be getting at once too maybe all oh yeah maybe maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. all of the same song <laughs> yeah damn right uh, okay yeah. i just and i had oh. another question if i may yeah. i noticed that sometimes um uh you bring uh sometimes i'll see you playing and you have a snare bass and a hi-hat mm -hmm. you know oh symbol and then other times you got a lot of stuff or, or the yeah. regular amount of stuff and, and different size bass drums, different yeah. discs, different that. Yeah. So you got a lot of different schemes going on here. Yeah. Um, uh, is this just the, you have a creative moment in your mind and okay, I need this this uh, ax to do this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it, it depends on the, the groups. Like um, there's a band I play with called the Fearless Flyers um, and they're, kind of a cool fun funky jam band three guitars and, and drums and for that band i've only played kick snare and hi-hat in that band and so um that particular thing kind of forces me to really do a lot with a little you know that yeah. constraint is like okay what am how am i going to make this interesting you know once in a while i'll pick up a shaker or something but that's <laughs> that's it and so I'm I'm like, okay, so how do I make this interesting for me first? Because the, hopefully the interest for me will, to Lenny's point, translate to the audience, you know? Um, so yeah, but that's that's the only band in which I've played the super minimal kit. The rest of the time, I'll at least give myself a ride cymbal and a floor tom or something, you know? Um, but yeah, that that's it, a lot of it will depend on the on the gig, on the setup. I love doing that. I do that too. I don't do yeah. it a lot. I do it if there's that's all that's there, or if there's somehow or another I'm lazy and I I always take a ride symbol because I mostly yeah. play winging stuff. But yeah. I, I like that a lot, man. It's yeah, a man. Lot can happen in there, or or you could just tip. Yeah, or yeah, whatever. No. There's the man. There's so much you can do. There's so much you can do, and it it, it forces you to be creative. Mm -hmm. You know, it really does. Where do you think um, where do you think the future of drumming is? And are you involved in any electronics? You know, 
Yes and no. I used to, man, I used to program a lot more when I, um, before I moved to New York, um, I had grand ambitions of being like an R and B record producer. You know, I really wanted to do that. So I got to, again, I got to shout you out, Lenny, because I know for, I don't know how much, are you still doing like record production stuff? Yeah, but anybody doing records no more. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, I, I am. I mean, but um, that whole, that whole situation has changed. Yeah, yeah. The, the way, and and I and and all due respect to all of us. Yeah. I just think that you know how people make music, mm. why people make music, has totally changed. It has. And so what happens is a lot of times, and we don't think about this, but there are a whole bunch of ancillary things around the music that have changed how people listen to the music. Yeah, it's true. And so from that perspective, yeah, I'm still doing projects, but I kind of like, you know, yeah, Yeah. you point and shoot. Yeah, I mean, it's. It's a little different. It's a little different. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I mean, I, you know, um, I was in the sort of late '90s and early aughts. I was at the crib, and I had my roads, and I had my MPC, and I was making my beats, and and I, I lost your sound, Lenny. I, no, I see your keyboards over there too. The oh left. yeah, you see. Right, right, you, right. see Come on now. Right, you guys still I, see I, the I, setup. I, I'm still, I, 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 I'm, I'm still hey, here. Hey, all right, all right. I'm still. I mean, I ain't, I ain't dead yet. <laughs> but, but um, but you know, I was you know like everybody else. I was trying to make records that sounded like D'Angelo. I was trying to make you know I was trying to make the next Neptune's hit. You know, I was trying to to get that. But um, you know, after I moved to New York and started playing, my emphasis went to to playing music live, and and it kind of really went to um learning about a different type of way that's of a, creating that's a good thing yeah that's a good thing because that that aesthetic yeah is still vibrant yes yeah you know I agree. we have to, we have to find our ways in there but that aesthetic is still still vibrant yeah. because yeah. that's what all of us here that's how we made music that's what we yeah. did that's right so yeah you know yeah, it was. It ended up being a blessing. I, at the time, I was a little salty that I didn't get my big hit record. You know, I was a little salty about it. But, but man, I, you know, I, I, I've been, I've been very fortunate. So I'm, you know, uh, but to answer your question, uh, Mike, about electronics, I do, I use, I do a lot of um, recording and editing on Pro Tools. Um, I've never integrated it into my live show stuff yet. I haven't, I don't know Ableton or any of that stuff to, to the point where I can integrate it into a live show. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was messing around for a little while with Sunhouse Triggers. I was doing a little bit of that stuff. Yeah, I um, love those. I love yeah, those. they're really cool. They're really cool. They actually have a new thing with Evans where yeah. they've integrated the triggers into the heads. Yeah. And so I'm going to get Evans to send me some so I can mess around with them a little bit. It's Mike's it's always been, Mike's always been into all of those different things and oh, like changing it. up and electronics and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Ever yeah. since I've known him, he's always been like that. You know? I had my first electronic drum in 1973. Okay. Okay. Wow. Wow. <laughs> now that thing is in the um, PAS museum. Right. <laughs> right. 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 But I mean, I, I don't use the electronics f- so much for natural drums. Yeah. And like the, like the um, um the instrument you were just taught sunhouse i yeah. use it for sounds i mean i'm i'm yeah. putting them in records but i use the sounds i don't use them to find a good snare sound or something right. like that right. Yeah. right 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 and on this um this britney howard tour i'm doing this is our first time integrating integrating ableton into the show uh-huh. and uh, we're using a couple of um rolling drum triggers on the snare kick drum and, and rack and so the the drum triggers are there because the the produced drum sounds that she wants to preserve for the live show are really hard to replicate live. So we're kind of trying to create a hybrid between yeah. the produced sound and the live sound. You know, yeah, it's been really cool. It is, um, and it's been kind of a challenge too because we've been 
you know, the whole band is on a grid now. We're all in the click track. We're all in the ears. And, you know, it's it's a different thing we were used to, you know. So it's a, when it's you a say the produce, song. The produce sound. Do you mean what, what was recorded? On, yeah. 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 yeah so what ended up on the mix? That. Yeah. Yeah. She wants to recreate it. So, so you know, um, the engineer who records Britney's records and produces this guy named Sean Everett. Yeah. He's a super imaginative engineer this guy does the weirdest shit to get sounds man make it happen you know yeah. and so he you know those sounds are so unique that we kind of end up just sort of sampling them and turning them into one shots that can be put on the trigger yeah. you know um so which which is cool you know but in my actual in-ear monitor mix i'm just i just want to hear the drums i'm playing it's kind of it's kind of tough for me to hear me playing those electronic sounds yeah get any kind of like warmth from it you know um but out front they're definitely using the hybrid of the two sounds cool. and it sounds cool i've heard the board tapes it sounds really great you know are you doing any movie work even as a drummer if not a leader and or t television writing or or just sideman, whatever. Yeah. Um, not I haven't. I mean, the last thing I did, um, actually, no, that's not true. I just did a, a film score um with uh Robert Glasper and Derek Hodge. They're working on something uh about Billy Preston, really beautiful documentary about Billy wow. Preston. Wow. And uh, I'm I'm playing drums on that. Corey Henry's on it, which is great. You know, he's amazing. Um, we just recorded that last month. I'm not sure when it's going to come out, but it, it's it's very exciting. And that's my second one with Rob. I've done, um, I did a, a show he was doing for HBO called Winning Time um, about the about the Lakers of Lakers in the 80s. Yeah, and, I watch that yeah. all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. You did both seasons? I did the first season. I did oh, the yeah. first. Uh, yeah, I did yeah, they the first. had two seasons. They had two seasons. They had two seasons. Yeah, it yeah. was really good. I, um, it was really good, man. It was really good. Rob, yeah. Rob, and uh, Robert and Nicholas Bertel did the first season together. They they co-composed, mm -hmm. and then the second season, I think it was um, this guy out of uh, L.A. named Jeff Beal and Robert Glasper. They yeah, I know that. Jeff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an incredible writer. He, yeah, he. Uh, I used to work with him. He's the guy who did the soundtrack for Rome. On, uh, oh right, yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. He did. He's done a lot of stuff. A All lot right. of stuff. I, I kind of remember. Didn't he do House of Cards too? He did House of Cards. Really? Stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that was a great show. That was a great show. Yeah, one, one of my favorites of all time. I think so too, man. Did you see the Max Roach? I did, man. I did. I was in, um, where Ooh. was I? I was in Nashville. I was rehearsing and I, somebody had tweeted that it was going to be, uh, they weren't going to stream it after midnight. Like I, I almost missed the deadline to see it on PBS. So I ended up watching it at like, you know, il, you know, 11 at uh, night. It was, it was amazing. It was amazing, amazing. To, to, to really show mm -hmm. how much of an influence, not just being a drummer yeah. but being a black musician yes with such stature yes you yes. know i mean it it he he took um he really elevated the drum set to like an instrument of of fine art right he, he was a composer he was a composer, he was a composer. no yes. no doubt about it no doubt about it he was yes. a serious influence on me like when i was in high school till the last and i played a benefit for him and he was there in a wheelchair with the blank. Hey Dave. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, there good he to is. see you, man. What's up, everybody? What's up? Brother, man? Hey. Good to see you guys. Wow, man. Hey, man. Been a man. Good to see you again, man. How are you? Yeah, good. I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I've been on the bus trying to yeah. get here. Yeah. And so I was uh I was all things Nate and kinfolk on the way okay. over here for four hours. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. I really enjoyed listening to you, man. Really, Thank really you, great, man. great stuff, you know. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'll never forget. I have to tell this story. Um, I did a clinic in uh, outside of San Francisco 
I guess this was about three years ago. And um, I forget what it was called, uh, drum shop out there. Anyway, I did the clinic and I played the whole thing. And then in the back, someone raises their hand with a question. And I look and it's David. <laughs> and I was like, man, I'm glad I didn't know he was here. <laughs> I'm no, so you played beautifully, know. man. You, you you did a great, great, great presentation, man. You played Thank beautifully. You, man. It was really, really good. Really, Thank really you, man. Enjoyed Thank it. you. I'm, I'm so great. I'm just glad I didn't know, man. Because I would have been, <laughs> I would have been stuttering and hemming and hawing. It would it would have been embarrassing. So. so let me get to get one thing in here. So, I was checking out your your pocket change recording, and yeah. that is really really slick, man. Just drum stuff. Thank you. Really outstanding. So what yeah. what gave you the idea to do that? We were just talking about Max uh, right before you joined. We were talking about Max Roach, and I remember. It wasn't until maybe my senior year in college that I actually peeped Drums Unlimited, that album, and remember listening to these solo drum pieces and being like captivated by them and like thinking to myself, yo, man, wouldn't it be cool to do a whole album where it's just like trying to tell stories with drum grooves, like starting with the, the different parts of the groove as like a different parts of the story, you know, and developing over the, and then um, a couple of things. It was like, you know, at the time on my socials and my, my, my social media feed, there was, I was doing these break beats. I would, I would post like one break beat every week, like a new break beat. And um, the, the videos were going crazy. People were just really getting into it. And they would, they would be 60 second videos, you know, just me playing a groove, maybe a little improvisation but me kind of laying into a groove and, and really playing it very um, like really kind of adhering to an idea, you know? And, and then when I did it, I was like, man, what, why don't I just put all these on a record? Like, why don't I just put some of these, these grooves on a record and see what happens and still do the same thing where I try to, improvise inside the context of the groove you know um so that was the first uh pocket change out that was the those were the ideas it was like what if max roach made a breakbeat album you know what i mean <laughs> in my mind like yeah, what if you know what thinking of the drum set as a recital instrument the same way we think about solo piano or solo That's violin right. whatever but like using it with modern sort of groove or hip-hop language in it you know yeah um, so I yeah, that name. I, I just, love the name. Oh, pocket change, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and because I I was checking it out, and you know, you're doing you're doing like time changes and tempo, you know, and tempo yeah. time change, time signature changes, and just kind of melding it all in and pocket change. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. The, the <laughs> way we're thinking about that, I feel like a lot of people use the term pocket. Mm -hmm. People are using it in different ways, you know. Um, me, me personally, I mean, I think people say, okay, man, you're a great pocket drummer. It's like, well, I mean, okay, that's great. But I feel like the pocket is about the band, actually. I think the pocket is where all of the members of the band agree on the time. Like, the, to me, that's the definition of the pocket. And if everybody's locked in that pocket, oh, man, that's that's grooving. You can be locked into a pocket as a solo musician, too, but... I do feel like the, the in, in my mind, the truest definition is when the band is locked in that thing together. And yeah, it's well, just make no mistake. If there's a pocket happening. Yeah. You dance, <laughs> you're driving that sucker. Oh, man. Yeah, thank you, man. Okay. Yes, cool. indeed. I have a question, a Max Rokes question. Yeah. And uh, now, okay, first of all, can any of us hear, I can do this, but I don't do it anymore because I lost a lot of skin on my knuckles. Now, we know what we're talking about here, right? Is this is this the hi-hat? Yes, the, sir. I uh, never learned how to do it. It's really never, easy, man. Look, you, you tilt the, you know, it's a triplet. You could do yeah. stick, you could do a double or single, but it's not, it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, you're above it, above it. But, and you just slightly, you hold it like this so you don't hit your knuckles and you slightly tilt the stick like yeah. that and then up and down can become, and then you get faster at the triplet or you can play some 
uh, doubles and and put some phrasing in a guards or yeah. whatever the thing is, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, but I was just gonna say, speaking of Max in high school, I tried to master this, and there was like my mother would come in and be there, blood all over the snare, blood on the rug, blood <laughs> on the and she'd be like, "What the hell is going on in there?" You know, I'm like, I well, mom, I is it Max Roach like, huh? You know. <laughs> 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 a, a massacre it's a high hat massacre night trying to be you know because they're you know showing off at snug harbor i'm like yeah let me get my max on and yeah. I ha, ha. My finger in the guy in the oh, high no closed it with my phone oh. oh, god you know oh. to act like i'm still off in it you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway, man i i um I could I, never do that either. I could. I do never it. learned it. I'm. I'm gonna nope. shed it, man. I want to get it together. I do want to at at some point play it successfully because it's it's a thing, man. It's it's a vibe. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's, it's this little movement right here, up and down. Yeah. And if you hold the fingers like that, I used to try to do it like that, and you can imagine the damage. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I um when when Betty died, um she had her her uh, memorial at Riverside Church. And Max played a hi hat solo uh, in dedication to her, and he played that. You know, he it was a kind of a famous hi hat solo that he always played. And so he came up, he brought his hi hat right up to the pulpit and played the solo. It was <laughs> unreal. It was you unreal. Know, Roy also used to. They'd be on a Latin vamp and and at McKell's, and he'd bring the hi hat down to the front of the stage, and bro, he would be ripping Jack. Same <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Oh my God! I, I mean, first time I saw him do that, I had tears of joy. Un, uh, you, know, you know, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> unbelievable. Steve Smith has that that pretty well put together. Yeah. Kind of does a really great job with that. Yeah, he's got a. I, I just saw him. He was um the they did a big thing for Zildjian. Um, they did a big uh, four hundredth anniversary thing, and they um honored. They did a bunch of honorees for their Hall of Fame. And Steve was one of the the honorees, um, and it was it was cool. It was it was it was a nice it was a really nice night. But um, I saw some video of him playing, and I was man, he's he's a he's a great player, man. He's a great, great drummer. Yeah, he's got a lot of depth in what he does. Yeah, for sure. I got a question, kind of for everybody, but I mean, Nate, you know, since you're out there and doing a bunch of new stuff, how often do you guys listen to new? seek out new music anymore and listen hmm. i i i found but i've changed i'm changing it that i was making music all the time but i wasn't listening to music you know sitting down and just enjoying music from you know the like you did when you were a kid yeah no that's a great question you know i will say honestly for me the last year maybe even longer year and some change I've been better about it. I've been trying to be better about it, about seeking new music out and not just the stuff that I'm familiar with or that is recommended by my friends, but like stuff that I wouldn't have checked out, you know, stuff that I wouldn't have checked out on my own. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing for all of its, you know, flaws, one thing about social media too, somebody will say something or post something that will make you think, man, what is that? You know, yeah. like what? I never heard of that before. And you'll find it and you'll be like, oh man, this is this is killing, you know. Um it's been it's been really cool, man. Like in the last couple of years, I've gotten into some really cool music that's been inspiring to me, you know, yeah. that I wouldn't have sought out otherwise. So it's yeah, I'm I'm and not just music. I mean, you know, um, there's a really beautiful museum of fine art here in Richmond. Um, and this really nice lady, uh, Valerie Cassell Oliver, she runs it, she's a curator. And so I've been kind of going to the museum and just like hanging out and really just kind of taking it in. It really helps. It really helps in a strange way. It, it really opens up another thing um, in, in, in my imagination about, you know, yeah. what's possible with music, you know? Yeah. That's a great question. On Spotify, you know, you can create channels and stuff. And I got into PJ Morton. Ooh. What a beautiful singer, man. And, and it's just so much emotion in what he does. And Jared Lawson's another guy, fabulous musician as well. Yeah, so yeah. 
I just, to me, those are like really great things to listen to, to just chill, you know, but then, you know, the other thing about, you, you said, Nate, about art museums, when we go to Europe, but we've been going to Europe for years, I always like to go to the museums and check out all of that beautiful art that's there. It's, I find it so inspiring and such a, a you know, a, a relaxing uh, thing, you know, to be yeah. in, in there and you see that the, this beautiful art that was created centuries ago. And yeah. it, still, it still speaks to people, you know, it's beautiful, you know. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It really is. There's a cool, there's a very cool um, uh, contemporary section of the museum that, um, you know, you, you kind of don't realize, man, how ahead of their time some of these artists were, you know, um, artists that were doing sort of uh, uh, photographic oil paintings they would take you know photographs and they would recreate the photographs with paint it's like you think about that man it's like how far ahead of the curve were they this day before an iphone and an iphone app could do this you know this is like they did it with their mind you know you're watching that and you're like man this there are things you can really um take away from that that are that are really inspiring you know um but no it it's it's incredible i, I find that you know I used to read a lot more. I feel like I should get back into it, you know, um, because that was opening up a portal for me too. Like when I was reading a lot, it it really would kind of like, you know, uh, I don't know, it, it would just activate something in me that would say, man, what if, you know, that was always the question. Like, what if you, you, you tried this versus this, you know, th there would always be something that would happen when I would read that would open something up like that, you know? So that's something I'll get back to too, you know? Um, you have a Kindle? I, man, I used to, I lost it. I have an iPad though. Yeah. So I've been, I've been reading on, on my iPad. The last thing I read, um, I reread uh, Sting's memoir, uh, Broken Music, which is, really beautiful i mean he he he's he's a really good writer i love art also i've started like a year ago working with uh ai art which um, i don't want to get into a big discussion but um i found that that's like talking politics so um but it has enabled me or driven me to, to really I subscribe to all the art magazines now, you know, online and to explore that world. What people are doing now is just amazing. Like yeah. that, new, that new piece they just installed or bought in at MoMA in New York by this guy named Rafik Arnadal. And it's all data. And it's like, it's like uh, 50 feet high, but it looks like it's coming out of the wall and it moves and it does this. And it's just, unbelievable what's going on in the art world it's it's um and then for books i realized you know i really like to read as well but i can't keep buying all these books that i thought think i might be interested in but there's ways to do it there's um there's a a, a, a app called scribd s-c-r-i-b-d and you yeah. it's like eight bucks a month but they have a ton of books on there and yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the library not not going in even but just online you can so all of it's stimulating i think one of the be the best things or or the most important things about growing older is to stay curious you know and, yeah. and keep yourself open to new things because there is a lot of interesting music going on i think that english the london jazz scene is really interesting because they're incorporating electronics into it um a little more freely than people in the U.S., but uh, you know, the, the more boundaries that are broken down, I think, is better as well. Definitely yeah. better. I agree with yeah. that. I agree with that. I'm writing classical music. I just recorded um, a piece that I wrote with the NYU Orchestra. Okay. And in the middle of mixing it now. Beautiful. But they asked me to write a percussion ensemble piece. And then I said, but I've never really heard a percussion ensemble that really swung. Now, Tony did stuff with his 
percussion music, and Max with M. Boom did that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But a lot of that music was improvised. Yeah. And so when I wrote this piece, none of it is improvised. I wrote a piece of music that I never, ever intended to play. Okay. So I made it really hard. <laughs> so, that, so that I could so that I could sit back and get some classical guys to play it and me say, Yeah, she did not playing it right. <laughs> right. Well, well but hold up, but hold up. So they said we want to record your piece, but we want you to play it. Oh. Whoops. And I, <clears throat> I said, man, I can't play that. I mean, I, I wrote it so that it's really hard. So, you know, I could get somebody who was a, you know, but now I have to learn it. Wow. Oh, there you go. There you uh, go. Man. That's I it. wrote it. And I got to play it. You stepped oh, in it, man. Yo, man. <laughs> this is a stick, bro. This is going to right. kick my butt. Oh. Give it what you wish for. So, so, so it's, yeah. it's for 16 pieces. Wow. Two drum sets. Hmm. So I'm going to play one of the drum sets, and Billy Drummond is going to play the other drum set. <clears throat> when is this going to happen? Um, next month. Is there a concert? No, we're going to record it. We're going into the studio and record it. You're going into what's his name's over there? No. No, at NYU, there's a great $100,000 new building that they have that has a fantastic studio. Really? Good to oh, know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice, man. So now I got a. Now I, I know the piece because <clears throat> it's in my head, but now I have to look at it yep. and play it. Yep. <sighs> For me, what? That, well, that, you have an I'm going to have to change. I so I have a learning curve yeah. that I'm going to actually dive into that is totally out of my comfort zone. Which yeah. is what? Which is what? I got to read what I wrote. Your interpretation <laughs> of you. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, because because see some of that stuff. I don't know. Some of that stuff is going to be very weird for me to do. I mean, but uh, we'll see what happens. That's great. Yeah. Maybe it'll you. cause you to uh, do some editing. Oh, of course. Without a doubt. Without, without a doubt. Are you kidding? Yeah. I'm doing a Bill Mikowski. And we just finished a book on me. Huh. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. And uh, it's been shopped to a couple of places. We got a couple of bites, and and uh, and, and uh, so I got to clean it up a little bit. But it's like just kind of my story. And I I don't know whether I don't feel I don't like I'm not a big star, so I don't know whether I mirror it. But he said, "Why don't you do it, Mike?" And he's called Hitman. It's gonna come out. And I told all of the crazy shit that happened to me on the way to the uh, forum. Uh, good, uh, good. I, don't, I laid it out there, Jack, me and Paul Jackson the whole night. Well, I can't wait well, to hear this piece, Lenny. I, I'm, I'm excited to hear this, man. Yeah, this, me too, man. Built your hot seat, man. Now, now, you, now you're in it. That's incredible. Man, it's called The Magnificent Seven. And basically what it is, it's an homage to The Magnificent Seven. And... Man, you know, I I never ever thought that I would have to play it. That's right. So like this is gonna be really very, very challenging, man. <laughs> there, yes, Mike, there will be a lot of editing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey, can I bring up our AI once more? Because I've been looking at a lot of stuff lately whether it be movies or scientific stuff or all kinds of presentations of AI, including what they're dealing with, with the Writers Guild and, and music and AI. Yeah. yeah. And it is, I don't know if it's frightening or inspiring or where it's all going to go. Cause there's some pretty heavy stuff going on in regards to AI, you know? Yeah. And, I mean, it's, it's one of the most controversial things going on. Yes, it is. Releasing Pocket Change 2 next month. And I hope that 
they don't just up and release pocket change three, four, five, six without me you know, <laughs> <laughs> take take all my shit and just start chopping it up. <laughs> Make it happen. I don't know. You know what I mean? Meanwhile, I'm just still working on trying to this hi hat trick. You know, I don't know. You know. <laughs> But no, it, it it is it's an interesting time, man. I don't I uh yeah I've been thinking to myself like, you know, what if there was a last gasp, like that there, there was a movement that people had where we went back to like physical objects, you know? We went back to vinyl, CDs, landline mm-hmm. telephones. You know what what would happen if that if there was ever this, you know. Um, because I feel like right now, there I'm seeing a lot of uh, like young, very young people on social media saying, "Man, wouldn't it be nice if there was just one phone and it was at your house and yeah. it, oh, oh. one number, and then you but people could call you and you could only talk to like one and you couldn't text on it or anything like that." I was like, "Yeah, I grew up with that phone. Like you know, we Never. we were." that phone yeah that's good i I just read an article today nate that um uh what's really interesting is that barnes and noble bookstores are are like thriving Mm. and rather than digital reading and stuff which i do but i mean barnes and noble remember that that was like years ago now and when amazon really kind of ruined it for bookstores but it's there's a big rise in people wanting to hold books again and read them. And yeah, yeah I, I, I was just in the bookstore. I mean, it's back. It was packed. Yeah. I, 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 right before, right before Thanksgiving, it was packed. Bookstores yeah. are great, man. They're yeah. amazing. Bookstores are great. People want, con- Oh, we got an album. I've never had it. My, I've been on a lot of vinyl, but I've oh. never I own this is brand new. So they're now they're doing this again. I, I thought the guy, <laughs> I thought I was just making a record and it was going to be a CD. So I got me a little vinyl here, you know. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, nice, man. Congratulations. That's beautiful. That's amazing, man. Yeah. And I think, I think people are just craving human connection, especially after COVID. Like, you know, we were so stuck in our bubbles. Um, Everyone was afraid to touch each other and afraid to hang out, afraid to have dinner and, I feel like it's moving the other. I think we we learned, you know, in a very profound way, at least for me, that you know, human touch, human interaction is yeah. We you know, and that's that is something that I don't know if there will ever come a point at which AI can figure that out. Can there, approx- you know? I don't know. That's a that's a very that's a I don't. There know. lies the defining line. I think you know. Yes, absolutely. Mind, you know, like I, I don't think that that's the issue for AI, right? See, you you you're you're looking at AI and thinking of AI being human, right? AI yeah. is, AI is totally different, artificial, yeah. right? They don't need the things that humans need, right? And so what they do is create what they create to coexist so the fact of the matter is the bigger they get they no longer have to coexist they can do without i tell you man there's nothing like having a bunch of people that you work with you worked with for years of course i I agree with you a thousand percent you connect to them and you say stupid shit to each other and laugh (laughs) and have fun and make your music and create you know create together i mean when that while the 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 lockdown was going on, I missed the guys, man. Yeah. Dave, you yeah. you speak truth. You speak. Well, truth. I dig that, but I, I wouldn't no mind truth. Having, if they made me a like a fine looking little Susie. They are, Mike. They are. Yeah. Out there, little Sandra. Susie, keep the curse word, but be a little Susie, but keep the curse word. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Uh-huh. <laughs> hey guys, I I do have to, I have to leave, man. So we got. I it. just I just want to let everybody know, man. It's great to be back, and it's great to have great conversations with forward-thinking people like Nick Smith. Yes. Thank you.
100 percent, man. And and Nate, I've followed you quite a bit. I will continue to do that. Yes, because I, if I do that, I will be inspired. Thank you. So. Thank I I can't wait to hear this piece, man. I can't wait to hear it. I, I'm that's exciting. You and Billy, yeah. To yeah. Get, come on, man. Then we got to play them damn notes. <laughs> <laughs> so Nate, <laughs> Nate, in closing, man, and it's just an honor to to be with you, man. I really enjoy what you're doing. I think it's completely cool. I mean, one of the things I love about uh, uh, players is when I listen to them. That really lights me up is I don't hear anyone else in their playing. And right. when I listen to you, I don't hear anybody else. I hear you, and yeah. I'm going, oh, "This is this is good, man." Thank you. Go on, brother. That's that's a, that's the highest compliment. Brother, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. I found that to be true too. Great to hang with you, Nate. Thank yeah, you, guys. Thank you thank for you. agreeing to do this. It's a pleasure. Absolutely, man. My <laughs> honor. Thank you guys so much. This was great. I can't wait to see it. I don't know when it's gonna <laughs> when is it coming out? Uh, you have no idea. When you see it, you say, eh, wow, they did all that. Whoa, <laughs> wow. <laughs> it looked like a real <laughs> ass movie. <laughs> wow. Oh, oh, man. Man. <laughs> <laughs> okay guys <laughs> all right then. Thank you, everybody thank you thank you nate thank you brothers of the stick all guys. of us man yeah, you. they're all such great drummers i'll see you i see you yeah all right, <laughs> all right brothers Later. all right man oh. yes sir good night all right